day 971 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently Russia sits on more than 680,000 military personnel losses, with a monumentally staggering 1,710 personnel losses within the last day. Now, in my analyzing of past data, this represents the largest single day loss of Russian personnel in the entire war. And it was just yesterday that I mentioned that we're witnessing unprecedented levels of frontline activity. With multiple heavily contested areas seeing intense fighting simultaneously, all of which makes for a battlefield outcome like this 1710 figure, especially when it involves an army performing offensives, acting like a mindless horde, jumping into frontline battles without consideration for any sort of soldier longevity. Then to take a look at the hardware losses, so 24 tanks, 64 APVs, 24 artillery, and one air defense system. So these systems keep adding up, this time it was a Book M3 air defense system located about 60 kilometers from the front line, and it also happens to be the latest iteration of the book series, with an estimated value of between 40 to 50 million US dollars. And as it so happened, it was taken out by a heavy Baba Yaga drone. Then we'll head to the map and start out in Kursk today, where a number of sources reported advancements by the AFU just to the north of Suja. Specific details haven't been provided, which is usually quite typical of fragmented or delayed information due to the AFU's stringent adherence to operational security measures. But there was also a great deal of activity to be seen in this region as well. With, for instance, a captured Russian Gaz 3308 vehicle, then also a Russian Orion UAV that was shot down today by a Ukrainian short-range Strela-10 air defense system. Then that was followed by footage from the Flying Skull unit of the AFU, seen tearing into Russian positions in Lubimovka. But also was the case in Kursk of a Russian BTR armored personnel carrier destroyed by a Ukrainian FPV that reportedly utilized an auto-targeting system. And if you look closely enough on the freeze frame, you can see the success of the green auto-targeting lock-on. The quadcopter knew exactly what it was aiming for. It appears that a second FPV came in to complete the job, but the ultra-efficiency of the first drone's automated targeting system made for no follow-up required. Truly a taste of things to come. Then headed into the Ukrainian map through to the Donbass, where Russians continue working through the southern angle of the Shasiv Yar front. Now, um, firstly, I'll zoom in here, but uh, if Russia can hold and expand this bridgehead, then the AFU would certainly have some concerns on this front, keeping the Russian soldier rush at bay and avoiding withdrawals in the process. Now, you might be wondering, so as for the Avtosh 504 bridge over the canal, as we are aware that the bridge isn't fully operational, with some damage sustained to it sometime in the past, so it's not operating at full capacity and may be considered unsafe for heavy armored vehicles. Though, if it is getting some utility from the Russian forces, then there's likely to be some form of follow-up targeting of that bridge by the AFU. Then we'll head down on the map to the Pokrovsk direction, with what's been described as persistent attempts by the Russian forces to press on Maximilianivka. Now, most recently, Moscovites stormed with another mechanized column, and this is more specifically the Karakova direction, where the Russian storm assault was focusing on the southern part of the village, with taking some significant losses in the process. And since we're in this direction on the map, it's well time to show the following that we saw a grim New Testament to the insane losses and reckless actions to which Russian commanders are sending their soldiers. This time, Russian troops were reassigned from their motorized rifle division to a regiment without their consent, 
which put them at considerable unease due to their documents that were taken as well, and most of their phones. Now, one thing to note here, if you ever join the Russian army, which I'm sure you won't, but if your ID or your identification documents are taken from you, that is not a good sign at all. You get stuck in a location and should you reach your untimely demise on the battlefield, it helps the Russian MOD to go out of their way to not include you on any of their own private loss figures. But as for this latest blunder of a story, the soldiers' items were taken away from them, followed by a whole bunch of ghastly threats from their commander about welding them to a BMP and sending them in the Kurokova direction as a meat wave. But as we see here, and as always, some phones made it out. And as such, the men are looking to put the word out on this heinous treatment that they're receiving in the Russian army. Then also, somewhere in the eastern direction of the map, we saw yet another Russian T-90M breakthrough tank destroyed during today's attack on the positions of Ukraine's 46th Brigade. Now, of course, for what I just mentioned, the assigned name of the tank is breakthrough. It did not break through. Then briefly on the map, we'll look into Russia. Start out in Belgorod, as there were air raid sirens continuing to be audible, which is quite common these days for the Oblast, and much like their neighboring country of Ukraine. Then also, just a couple of hours ago, in a Russian Oblast not too far away, explosions were heard near the Bryansk International Airport, according to local residents, with further details still being clarified on the matter. Though, as you can imagine, this international airport's operations are relatively limited in this day and age. Oh, and of course, the occasional use for the Russian military. Then we'll head across to some news for today. So, well, just yesterday, the French government announced that it would use 300 million euros in interest generated from frozen Russian assets to purchase new equipment for Ukraine. The funds will go towards 12 Caesar self-propelled howitzers, as well as 155mm shells, the Astus SAMs, the Mistral SAMs, so the surface-to-air missiles, and their aviation-launched hammer munitions as well. Now, as for this funding used, specifically the interest generated is from frozen Russian assets held within France as part of a broader EU set of sanctions where it includes a mix of personal, state and corporate Russian assets. And this is truly a fascinating source of direct military aid funding to utilize against the very country that no longer has control of the revenue accrued from those frozen funds. Then headed to some interesting Ukrainian hardware news, as Ukraine has unveiled its latest innovation in drone warfare with the development of the Sting Drone, a purpose-built unmanned aerial vehicle designed to track and intercept Russian Shahed-type drones. The Sting can fly at altitudes up to 10,000 feet and reach speeds of over 100 miles per hour, or about 160 kilometers, and is intended to complement or even replace traditional air defense systems in some regards, offering a new approach to counter Russia's aerial attacks. Now, one of the key advantages of the Sting drone is its affordability. According to its developers, it costs significantly less than the Iranian-designed Shahed drones that Russia has launched in large numbers against Ukraine, where the Shahed drones are expected to cost anywhere between 40 to 60,000 US dollars a piece, whereas these interceptors cost about 1 to 2,000 dollars a unit, with a cost that is expected to come down over time with manufacturing refinements and economies of scale from the high production. Now, as an example, here is what these quadcopters would be intercepting. A visual look at the Russian Shahed drones in action flying over a region of Ukraine, and this was just a few days ago. The Sting would get the call up from radar installations and move to intercept fairly quickly. We've seen it, of course, happen with a lot of the recon drones, the Russian recon drones. It's just the case that this new development is much more optimized to take out the Shaheds. Now, still, not a great deal is known so far about these platforms, although I would expect these tiny interceptor drones to use shrapnel-based warheads because they maximize the damage radius by scattering fragments upon detonation, increasing the chances of successfully disabling or destroying aerial targets like Shahed drones. 
Initially, these tiny interceptors will be human operated, but the time will later come where the mathematical precision of an AI controlled drone of this caliber will make Russia's Shahed drones more or less obsolete. Which I should quickly point out is something of a problem because Russia has mostly gone all in on the Shahed platform, being the major type of their kamikaze drones that they deploy. Then headed across to another Russian hardware update segment, as it's most recently been the case that Russian servicemen are making similar complaints about the quality of electronic warfare systems they've been issued with. They claim, well, quite a number of things really, saying for instance that there's the use of cheap metal, the failing and useless antennas, everything just falls apart, the magnets are worthless, and the bolts just fall off. And this guy in the video almost perfectly exemplifies Russian military contractor corruption, as he states that this equipment is Chinese garbage that was just rebadged by a local military supplier. How right he is, because as a Russian oligarch military contractor, why bother invest millions of dollars into research, design, production, in setting up a whole supply chain of a headache, when instead you could just buy on the cheap, rebadge the device, and then line your pockets with millions at the same time. With their primary goal, to get that new super yacht they always wanted. Ah, the Russian way. Then headed across to a Russian military mobilization success story, perhaps? Now, starting off, we saw these two Russian men last week. They deserted on frontline assault duties from a drunken commander that goes by the name Prokop, who they claimed was needlessly taking a very heavily attritional approach to his own units, forcing them to perform kamikaze assaults on AFU positions across minefields at night. Under these conditions, these guys then manage to desert and find shelter, food, even a bath somehow, perhaps finding a vacant basement in occupied Donetsk. Now, after that, they are publishing rap videos in which they explain why they deserted from the front lines. The rap lyric vocals include stories about getting no food or water, the sending of soldiers to the slaughter in droves, and a whole bunch of other shoddy poor treatment. They also rapped about wishing their commander cirrhosis of the liver, so it looks like a Prokop drinks an awful lot. So will these raps do much? Probably not, to be honest, and certainly no immediate effect. But the fact that a couple of Russian soldiers defected, followed by using the artistic medium of music, where they then uploaded it for all Russians to see, which by the way is devastatingly illegal under Russian law, but these kinds of activities have the effect of broadcasting to a larger audience a message into Russia of the true realities faced by many Russian soldiers who head off to the SMO. It's not going to boost the morale for the Russian army, that's for sure. The cracks are showing as disillusionment spreads. Then headed across to a quick funny to round it all off for today, guys. More of an oddity, perhaps. On the state media TV front, Russian propagandists are already back to the West is freezing stories. And no doubt the first of many for this winter. With this time focusing on the UK, but further adding that a British porn star has to live in a tent and use hot water bottles because she cannot afford housing and heating. Although she managed to take some Instagram worthy snaps. Now, I don't know a great deal about the struggles of this UK porn star, but clearly the Russian media has picked up this story to feed to its masses to show how much better life is in Russia than anywhere else on the planet, even if the subject of their story isn't exactly the most relatable of people. But given the state of Russian society at the moment, they really have no option but to run with stories like these as a means to take away the focus on their own internal economic struggles that the paranoid bunker boy of the Kremlin, Mr. Putin, has perhaps single-handedly now forced them to grapple with. Oh, and we will see our fair share of these Russian media stories in the upcoming months. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. I always really do appreciate it. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for the likes, the comments. Always helps boost out the channel, you know, spread the message, that kind of thing. And yeah, so thanks so much again. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.